Hey guys, Hybrid here with another screenplay. This one being Aquaman, King of Seas. Now, if you couldn't tell, this is, this is the second Aquaman screenplay I've done. The first one is titled Rise of a King, and I highly recommend you check that one out before you listen to this one, mostly because this is obviously a sequel to it, but out of all my sequels, this really carries off of what occurred in the first one. Uh, so I'm not going to obviously, because usually these are kind of long when I'm like reading them out, so for the sake of time, I'm not going to go in depth about every single detail that's from the first one. So if you don't want to be confused, I highly recommend you check out the first one. Also, this does stem off Justice League, so I recommend you check Justice League out too. But it's not a must, per se. Like You could really easily catch on to like anything that comes off of Justice League. So, yeah. I guess we could begin. Um, I just want to say, obviously this took me longer to make than my other screenplays. That's because I researched ancient uh, Greek governments, like in the city-states. So I found out there's a few monarchies, actually, in the ancient Greek times. And I looked at those because, if you didn't know, Atlantis has a king, thus a monarchy. And also, ancient Greece and Atlantis, it would be believed that Atlantis would have a similar government to you know ancient Greece. So I read a lot about that. And I also talked to Armin, who's a big history guy and Aquaman guy, so I could really get a feel for what the Atlantean government would be like because a lot of this film deals with Aquaman as the king of Atlantis. Not just a superhero, but he's a king, first and foremost. So, I don't want to waste any more time. Uh, let's begin. So, this film takes place about a year after Justice League, give or take a few months more or less. I don't have a definite time slot when it begins. But the film starts off at an unknown location with a group of about seven mercenaries being briefed on what the public knows regarding Arthur Curry, a.k.a. Aquaman, and also Atlantis. Because if you didn't know, obviously Aquaman's part of the Justice League. The Justice League had a very public appearance, so to speak, in the Justice League screenplay I wrote. So everybody knows about them now. And obviously, in turn, everybody knows about Atlantis now. So their leader... Uh, who calls the group the Outsiders. I know the Outsiders in comics are a hero group. In this one, they're going to be villains. Uh, you know, obviously that could change around if another Outsiders group gets made, but just for the sake of this, you know, just deal with it, I guess. But anyways, the, their leader tells them that they will strike in two days. And then we go to Arthur, who's pondering on his throne. Now, Arthur is currently very stressed because he's dealing with a lot, obviously being the king of Atlantis, but also because of the repercussions from his involvement with surface world activities without the Atlantean Assembly's consent, such as him being with the Justice League and also secretly visiting his father's grave in Amnesty Bay, Maine, which is also where the Curry Lighthouse is. Um, like I said, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about much more in depth if you, if you listen to the first Aquaman screenplay I did. Now, the Atlantean Assembly basically think of Congress in a sense, uh, which... By the way, ancient Greek monarchs did have, they had assemblies that they had to report to. But anyways, the Atlantean Assembly gave Arthur about a, a year to address Atlantis and its people on the subject of, you know, his surface world activities and the surface world in general. But Arthur, Arthur's, you know, he doesn't really know how to proceed with it because it's a very delicate topic for many Atlanteans. So Arthur calls his advisor, Volko, for guidance, which Volko provides, telling him to talk to his wife because, you know... That's one of the things she's there for, just be supportive in hard times, good times, you know, all, et cetera, et cetera. Now, Arthur agrees with this and goes to his wife, Mara, who's on a deck outside of their bedroom looking out at the beautiful Atlantean capital, Poseidonis. I think that's how I say it. Um, it's basically Poseidon with, like, an I-S at the end. So, Poseidonis. Anyways, he mentions his situation to Mara, who, after getting on him for, you know, basically waiting to tell her this stuff kind of at the last minute... Um, you know, he's on, she's honest with him and says that he has the Atlantean Assembly's respect, especially after, you know, the heroic actions he did protecting Atlantis in the first, you know, screenplay I did. He has their respect. He has the people's respect. So he doesn't need to worry about that. But, you know, Mara also says that she doesn't believe any ill. You know, they don't mean any ill will by having him give an address. But instead, they just want clarification from him as he is the king. Arthur feels, you know, relieved after thinking about what she said, and, you know, they embrace. And, you know, they're husband and wife, so make with that as you will. 
But anyways, later on, when they're relaxing in bed, Mera reminds him to visit Orm, who, if you don't know who Orm is, that's Ocean Master, that he was the villain in the first screenplay, also Arthur's half-brother, who has been making great strides in reha- rehabilitation after the events of the first screenplay, because he's currently in Atlantean prison. Now, Arthur acknowledges the progress Orm has made while declaring his host to have him by his side because Orm is still, you know, one of the few biological family members he has left besides his mother, Atlanta, who now lives near the Curry Lighthouse as she feels guilty about not being there for Thomas, who's Arthur's father, before his death. Now, Arthur and Mara, and by the way, if you don't remember, Atlanta, Arthur's mom, gave up her claim to the throne, so to speak, her title as queen, Uh, when Arthur took over so she could kind of not move on with her life but so well I guess in a sense so she could move on with her life and do stuff like you know be at the Curry Lighthouse stuff like that so Arthur and Mara then decide to rest as tomorrow evening is when Arthur gives his address to the Atlantean Assembly now back to the mercenaries we see the leader of them in his quarters he takes off his gear revealing himself to be an African American male or a black male if you prefer that term and, also, and almost right after, one of the other mercenaries walks in, also taking off her gear, calling him by his name, David. If you look up an African-American male named David related to Aquaman in the comics, you'll know where I'm going with this. So he tells her, her name is Jen, she has no importance in the comics, I just made her up, not to say his name out loud, as it's kind of a lack of professionalism, and also it may alert the rest of the outsiders to the fact that they have a relationship. Because he's kind of trying to keep that obviously on the DL because you don't really just go, you know, walking out being like, hey, your team, like one of the team members is with me in a relationship, blah, 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 blah. So he also says that he's the one her joining on the mission coming up because they do have a son together. Uh, So obviously they do have a very deep relationship and their son's actually on board. He's, I'd say, probably around 10, 11 years old. And, you know, this mission, as David points out, could easily go wrong. So he doesn't really want to risk losing her and also his son. And we get a little bit about David's backstory. He talks about it where, you know, when he was younger, his father died at sea mysteriously around where they believe Atlantis is located. And, you know, he blames the Atlanteans for his father's death, obviously. And this is why he's so driven to kill Aquaman, primarily among all of, all of the other Atlanteans. Because he, you know, thinks they're a freak of nature, an abomination, basically, to the natural order of things, and wants to eradicate them from the earth. And also, you know, he doesn't want, like I said earlier, he doesn't want to risk losing his son and obviously Jen. So they talk, they're talking about this, and shortly after, David's radio goes off with the voice, um, doesn't matter whose voice it is, really, saying that, though, that they've located the supposed surface home, surface world home or surface home, I should say, of Aquaman, Now, which is the Curry Lighthouse. Now, David responds um, back to them saying to set that as their destination, and we see the outsiders board, the, board a ship leaving a port out to sea. The next day, back in Poseidonus, or the capital of Atlantis, Arthur goes to visit Orm. Now, Orm, due to a very convincing trial with the Atlantean Assembly, and also Arthur, and, you know, sympathy all around, declared that his father was the cause of his actions and brief insanity and that's why he's not incarcerated now out of necessity but more so out of his own personal request because he doesn't feel he's really ready yet to go back out to the world because if you listen to my first screenplay he did do some pretty messed up stuff in a sense uh kind of think of it as i like think of it as kind of like the thor loki relationship in a way now orm you know asks arthur how atlantis and their mother is doing primarily among other things and you know Arthur assures him that they're you know everything's doing well when Orm's ready to come back home they'll be ready with open arms too because they want they want him to be back they want to make a whole family again they they don't like the whole like family member being gone um right now so Orm says he's not ready yet because he's still guilty over his actions but when he is he'll make sure you know he lets him know So they talk for what appears to be, you know, another hour or so until Arthur realizes he needs to go to the Atlantean Assembly now to give his, you know, kind of his State of the Union. Basically, it's like a State of the Union address he has to kind of give. So Arthur heads off to the heart of the capital, Poseidonis, who I'm not not even going to say the name anymore. I'm just going to say the capital because I keep on mispronouncing it. And he goes to the heart of the capital to the Atlantean Assembly where Mera and Volko are also there to support him, especially Volko, because that's his 
advisor. So he's making sure that you know Arthur stays calm and collective because obviously Arthur, like I said, he's a bit stressed out, he's a bit nervous. And at the same time, the Outsiders reach the Curry Lighthouse, geared up and ready to kill Aquaman. Or at least who they think is Aquaman. Obviously it's not Aquaman because he's in Atlanta still. Now, these, the next few things I'm going to say takes place at the same time. So if this was like in a movie being filmed right now, it would basically cut from you know one thing to another, one thing to another, one thing to another, and then so on and so on. So let's begin. So basically Arthur talks about how as much as Atlantis would like to not interact with the surface world... The type of threats emerging in this world now, you know, it's no longer possible to do that because threats are now becoming global threats, which are as much of a threat to Atlantis as they are to the surface world nations. And back at the Curry Lighthouse, the outsiders find Atlanta, not Arthur, and think she's the current queen of Atlantis because obviously she still wears royal attire and they start attacking her. And she holds them off initially, but eventually their numbers and equipment overpower her because they were prepared to fight Aquaman. Uh, and obviously Aquaman is a much more combat, com- combative opponent than, you know, his mother. So they eventually overpower her, and when she falls heavily beaten, David wearing special gear, and if you don't know by now, David's actually Black Manta, and the special gear he's wearing is basically just like the Black Manta gear he has. He walks up to her and says, the queen is dead, before two beams from his helmet of energy, energy beams basically, which are kind of like heat beams too, you know, come from his helmet, mortally wounding her. So she's not dead yet, but she's pretty hurt. Uh, and David, using the code name, like I said, of Black Manta, tells the outsiders to leave. Um, and he knows that she'll try going back to Atlantis for medical attention, so he leaves a tracker on her. Uh, so hopefully when she goes back to the ocean, you know, she can, you know, lead them to Atlantis. Because obviously they notice that she's not Aquaman, but give and take you know like they're gonna work with what they have but as soon as she hits the atlantic ocean to swim back though she instead sends a telepathic message across the ocean to arthur and orm saying she loves them before she dies because she's currently dying from her wounds she's basically bleeding out um if you don't remember i'm just gonna say this because i'm sure this might be confusing arthur's bloodline like his mother all of them they have the whole telepathic thing with the sea life and all that stuff Oh, that's unique to the royal bloodline. That's one of the things that makes them, you know, distinguishes them as the royal bloodline in my DC universe. Orm is half, um, half, not full. He doesn't have the, uh, that telepathic stuff. He instead has hydrokinesis. That's what makes him special. And obviously he's also gifted in Atlantean magic. But moving on, in the capital, Arthur finishes his address to the Atlantean assembly But before he can formally end it, he receives his mother's message. And Arthur, with sudden sadness, announces announces to the Atlantean Assembly that their previous queen, Atlanta, has just been murdered. And then he exits quickly while Mera and Volko try asking him questions. And, you know, Arthur explains to the best of his ability until an Atlantean officer approaches him with news that Orm has left. Um, Arthur immediately realizes Orm's going to try getting revenge for against whoever killed their mother and gets his armor, which obviously is the Aquaman armor, and the trident Poseidon before departing himself. Now, Arthur communicates with the sea life to find out where Orm is heading, and he gets directed towards the Curry Lighthouse. And Arthur then swims as fast as he can to hopefully stop stop Orm from going on a rampage. Now, at this moment at the Curry Lighthouse, Orm, you know, he gets there now, and he's holding his mother's body, and he's bawling on the coast. Like, he obviously, he is destroyed his mother is murdered and you know it's so basically uncalled for like no one saw this coming but then he sees a ship off in the distance getting closer and closer and you know with the unstable mix of emotions he's currently experiencing he presumes that they're the murderers and goes off to attack them he happens to be right this is david and the outsider ship and they believe that Orm is Aquaman trying to save Atlanta. So they're readying their battle stations also. And Orm reaches the ship a second later. Obviously, he's very fast. Releasing a brutal attack with his hydrokinesis. Now, he splits the ship in half with Black Manta in his gear. Basically, you know, they're trying to fire a blast at him and, you know, hit him. But Orm's really fast. And this is the water we're talking about. And as an Atlantean, he naturally has the advantage in the water. So Arthur arrives briefly after Orm's already attacking the ship, and he's seeing the chaos he's, you know, causing. You know, 
Arthur tells Orm to stop, but Orm responds that these surface worlders killed their mother. You know, Arthur responds, you know, that's obviously a great crime and it's not right, but they will receive justice in, in the capital Poseidonis, not here. And, you know, Orm doesn't agree with Arthur and manipulates the water into a tidal wave to hopefully kill all the outsiders. But Arthur uses the trident Poseidon to reduce the wave so by the time it hits them, it's not, you know, so dramatic, but still pretty major. And Arthur then looks over at the coast where the outsiders, Black Manta, and parts of their ship have crashed at, where he sees a young boy critically injured, look, and he kind of looks like he might be still alive. So Arthur heads over there as soon as he can, attempting to save him through, you know, means he knows. Obviously that's not working, and Orm, you know, notices this too, and he didn't mean to hurt an innocent youth, and this really hits him home also, because he remembers, you know, how his childhood was, and he can't live with himself, you know, basically killing an innocent youth. So he arrives with um, to where Arthur and the boy are trying to help, and the boy's not responding, seems like he's going to die. So Orm tells Arthur to use the trident of Poseidon to enhance the Atlantean magic he's going to use to apply to keep him alive. So Orm draws a series of symbols across his back with Atlantean magic and also on his arms, which begin to light up as soon as Orm starts you know, the magical process. And Arthur then uses the energies of the trident of Poseidon to, to greatly augment them when he starts. So whatever Orm, magic Orm is using is being incredibly you know, enhanced at this point. So almost instantaneously, the boy wakes up, very weak but still alive. And Orm says he'll take him back to Atlantis, to which Arthur says he won't be able to survive the journey there until Orm points out that the boy has notable physical differences now. And basically, they didn't just save his life. They altered his biology, making him half Atlantean, uh, kind of similar to Arthur. So Arthur tells Orm to proceed with Black Manta, or proceed uh, while Black Manta gets up. And Arthur doesn't know Black Manta is still alive when he's getting up, because Black Manta is kind of getting up behind all of their backs because they're not paying attention to him. And it's caught off guard when energy beams hit him. Now, obviously, his armor and durability protect him from the, you know, the beams going through him, but it still hits him and it still kind of hurts. So then Arthur stabs the trident Poseidon into the ground, you know, so he can kind of fight him, you know, fist to fist, hand to hand. And he, you know, goes to fight Black Manta. Now, Arthur notices that Black Manta is a bit stronger and faster than the average person, but still doesn't compete with someone of, you know, his Atlantean abilities. So Arthur releases a, you know, he, you know, he hits him a few times. Obviously, Black Manta hits him. You get a fight scene until Arthur releases a really powerful punch, sending him several feet in the several feet away. And Arthur says, you know, he won't kill him yet. As per Atlantean law, the Atlantean Assembly must declare his crimes punishable by death first. And, you know, Arthur you know, is going back to retrieve his trident until Black Manta throws various bombs and, you know, made specifically to hurry Atlanteans like Arthur. And then the fight continues on with Black Manta using previously unseen gear, which he claims were just to kill Aquaman. Now, the gear helps even the odds a bit until Black Manta claims that he got pleasure from killing Atlanta, which causes Arthur to lose his composure and begin, you know, releasing very brutal attacks, really showcasing his enhanced strength and speed. And he lands one punch that actually sends Black Manta flying into the Curry Lighthouse. And it shatters Black Manta's helmet and even renders him unconscious. Now, seeing his chance to basically finish him off, he actually summons the Trident of Poseidon to him, ready to strike you know, Black Manta down for a killing blow. But before he can bring it down, Mera you know, appears, catching his arm. And, you know, she tells Arthur he can't exact revenge like Orm did, or tried to do earlier, as it's not the right thing to do, especially for him as the king. But Arthur tells her, you know, he's filled with so much rage, and this just feels so right. And, you know, but Mira says this wouldn't make him any better than Black Manta, you know, whatsoever, and he's better than this. So, really a supportive wife here. And, you know, Arthur, you know, he then leaves saying you know, with Mira saying that he'll send a few officers to get Black Manta to stand before the Atlantean Assembly. You know, Black Manta obviously isn't going to go free. So back in the capital, Poseidonis, which every time I mispronounce it, I say I'm not going to say it again, but then I can't help but try saying it again. But anyways, the young boy that they saved wakes up and he's kind of, he has some amnesia. He doesn't really know his name or anything like that. So Volko, 
who is appointed his teacher by Arthur, names him Calderon. And the film ends with Arthur receiving a notice that Orm has actually left the capital and gone to the independent city-state of Tritonis. And, you know, Arthur, he just kind of accepts it because there's nothing else he could really do, really, because it's an independent city-state. It's not under his kind of rule, so to speak. And Arthur then, you know, goes to where his mother was buried next to his father's grave. He actually buries his mom there per her request um, when she died. I guess in her will, it said, you know, for her to be buried here. And then Amanda Waller shows up. She tells Arthur that they want Black Manta, they being Argus. But, you know, Arthur tells her off, saying that he committed a crime against Atlantis and, you know, the royal crown of Atlantis. Thus, he will be tried under their legal system and probably will receive the death penalty. And she then leaves, leaving Arthur, you know, alone so he can mourn by himself you know, of his mother's death, because obviously this is really impactful to him, and that's where it ends. Uh, post credit scene, because I've been doing those, we see Amanda Waller telling an unknown person on the phone to keep closer tabs on Aquaman, as she believes the Triumph of Poseidon may be worth looking into, just like all the other ancient Greek weapons they've acquired with Wonder Woman's help. Because if you don't know, one of the things that Wonder Woman does with Argus in my DC Cinematic Universe is collect back ancient Greek artifacts that people have acquired and obviously due to their magical properties used for you know evil means so that's the end of it i hope you guys enjoyed it the next one is another green lantern one and yeah just comment below with your thoughts i hope you guys like it so like it if you did and this is hybrid i'll see you guys later